In October 1957, there came a sound from the clear October sky that changed the history of the world. And the sound was a simple series of beeps like the ones you hear right now. This sound could be heard by anyone with a simple ham radio. Yet those beeps and the machine that made them touched off the chain of events that transformed the planet for the rest of its history. From a missile range in Kazakhstan, several technicians working for the Soviet Union launched Sputnik 1, the world's first artificial satellite. The date was October 4th, 1957. Every 98 minutes, this aluminum ball Sputnik circled the globe. This was the start of the space race. Welcome to What the Math. Hello YouTube and this is a new series of videos in What the Math based on the history of spaceflight. This is video number one and we're going to be talking about Sputnik, the Soviet satellite also known as Sputnik 1 because it's the first satellite ever. Now in this particular video we're going to be using a mod called KW Rocketry and I actually am using these two tanks that are available in this particular mod because I wanted to make this rocket look as authentic as possible. This is an R7 rocket also known as Simurka which basically means 7 because this is a um, model number seven and this is uh, this was an ICBM basically this was meant to deliver nuclear payload to the United States but uh, Sergei Korolev who was essentially the equivalent to uh, Werner von Braun he was basically the the father of uh, Soviet rockets he decided to turn this beautiful design uh, into uh, a rocket that can deliver a satellite to space. That was actually his goal all along. He actually had to manipulate Soviet state to make it happen. Anyway, so let's start by... Uh, oh yes, yeah, so of course we're also going to be using um, a remote attack which allows us or basically doesn't allow us to use any unmanned vehicles above certain heights without connection. And we're going to be using KOS because back in the days um, uh, the Soviets had to develop a way to control the rocket remotely without really using any kind of guidance uh, and it had to fly itself so this is what we're going to be using because they had to come up with something and we have to do the same so I'm, I'm going to be using um, a script I, I wrote a few hours ago called Sputnik and it kind of looks like this uh, nothing special about it basically it's designed specifically to take this particular rocket into a very specific uh, orbital um, orbit. <laughs> uh, that was a pun. Not very funny. Anyway, moving on. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start this script and uh, just fly hands off. Uh, we're going to essentially, yes, get ready for launch, comrade. Three, two, one, and fly the rocket. Here we go. Beautiful takeoff and uh, I'm just going to kind of uh, talk about the history of the space flight and also mention the specifically important details about this flight. So, like I mentioned, this was an ICBM and it was actually the sixth attempt of launching this particular rocket because they were using these test rockets, which three of the three of which actually failed completely. So there was a 50-50 chance that this mission would not have succeeded. And the reason why the Soviets decided to launch this craft is because they've heard that the Americans were planning to launch uh, a civil satellite, or a civilian satellite, sorry, uh, which was supposed to basically, you know, uh, demonstrate the superiority of the Americans. But in 1957, the Soviets decided that they were going to be the first, and Korolev came up with this idea of launching basically a really simple satellite that would actually measure things like um, cosmic rays, magnetic fields, solar winds, and uh, it was supposed to be launched into space with this particular rocket. So we're about to have our stage separation right about now. Yay, nothing got destroyed, perfect. And now we're going to be going into our um, apoapsis of about 74 kilometers. Um, so, yes, I'm using KOS and it told me that boosters are out, comrade, attempting to stage, waiting for circularization uh, burn. So right now we are approaching 75 kilometer apoapsis, which is what I was aiming for. 
And um, the interesting thing about this particular uh, mission was that it was actually designed and created and launched within something like seven months. Basically, as soon as they decided to create this rocket, they made it out of nothing. Uh, and they really only just had the designs for the ICBM and it wasn't really that well tested. And so it was a very kind of a quickly designed and launched mission and surprisingly very successful. So the fifth launch was quite successful and the sixth was actually when they've attached uh, the, uh, the actual satellite to it. Now, the original satellite was supposed to be much bigger and it was supposed to have a lot more uh, various machines and apparatuses on it to measure all this like solar wind magnetic fields but unfortunately it was too heavy so it didn't really fly that well and ended up uh, basically it would not actually en end up flying because it would end up crashing when they launched a dummy satellite it actually crashed so instead Kurlov had this brilliant idea he's like well let's just make it symbolic let's launch uh, a shiny piece of metal that will just transmit telemetry. Essentially, telemetry means um, you're transmitting your situation. Your your uh, your signals are transmitting things like pressure, temperature, and so on. And that's exactly what they, they decided to launch. They essentially just launched um, a signal transmitter that would only show uh, it, it basically like sensor data. So. Uh, what you'll see when we open this uh, this part right here, when we actually open and deploy the satellite, you'll notice that it's essentially all it has is uh, telemetry data. Um, and the beeps that you heard were basically the signals of telemetry. So how are you doing satellite? I'm fine, thank you. That's what it was saying. If it had a rupture in its uh, capsule or if the temperature started to decrease, the signals would actually change in velocity. So the beep, beep, beep was actually telemetry saying everything is normal, I'm fine, thank you, uh, have a good day. Now we're going into our final burn right here and all of this is of course uh, automatic through the script which is, like I mentioned before, is absolutely my favorite new script. Uh, K um, the KOS is a must-have for this game because it teaches you programming, but it also teaches you how to do some amazing things like launch your spacecraft in unusual situations. All right, so we have released our Sputnik. Sputnik is now in orbit, Cormorant. Take that capitalist pigs, that's what it says in my program. Someone must have written it, probably me. Anyway, so Sputnik is now in orbit. Uh, we've released the antenna and it has now begun transmitting its telemetry. Uh, now here, I had to attach a battery right here, but the thing is I cannot really control this anymore because, or can I control this? No, I can't. I don't think I can. Let me just try this. No, I can't because it doesn't really have any control um, modules on it. So now we're just gonna run the time and let it run its battery dry. Now the actual battery lasted for 22 days, or uh, over 20 days essentially, and it was transmitting the signals for this entire time. And it only stayed in orbit for a few months because its orbit, uh, if you look at it, um, was, oh, so this is not exactly accurate. I, I just kind of made it more Kerbal-esque, but the actual um, elliptical shape was about the same. So it had um, a periapsis of about 223 kilometers, and apoapsis of about 960 kilometers, but the original apoapsis was supposed to be much higher, it was supposed to be about 1400 kilometers, it just didn't really calculate very accurately, uh, but nevertheless it was a very successful mission where even though it had such a elliptical orbit, they were able to kind of fly across the entire world, and this was actually why they decided to choose such an elliptical orbit. So it's actually not only elliptical, but it's also if you if you look at this, it's misaligned. It's it's a, about 65 degrees um, away from you know east west uh, direction. So this was so that they they could actually fly across the entire continent. And it actually flew by the United States seven times per day. So the Americans could hear it seven times per day. And the first person to hear the signal using the um, uh, the amateur radio was actually an American from Long Island, from New York. Uh, he was able to not only record the signals, but he was able to then take it to the NBC, I believe, uh, or I think it was NBC, or I forget which, which um, radio station it was, but they were able to play them to the entire world afterwards. Basically, the first person to announce Sputnik's transmission was not even the Soviets. It was actually the Americans who were able to hear it uh, using amateur radios. 
Now this satellite transmitted on two frequencies. It was 20 megahertz and 40 megahertz, and uh, it made one orbit in about 96 minutes. So every 96 minutes, no matter where you were in the world, especially if you were on, uh, on its path, you could hear the beeps, especially if you had the radio. But unfortunately, it only lasted about three weeks, and after about three months, the satellite descended into a lower atmosphere and crashed down. And the thing is, you could also see the satellite. Some people actually use binoculars to look into the sky and see it, but what they actually saw was not the satellite itself, but its lower stage. I don't know if I can find my lower stage now. And there's my lower stage right there. So what most people saw was actually this part. They couldn't really see the satellite itself, but people that claim to have seen it, they actually were looking at the actual ICBM that was still in the orbit as well and flying along with Sputnik. Now, what was inside this sphere? So this was actually really interesting because inside of the Sputnik sphere, you had another sphere. And then inside of that sphere, it was actually filled with nitrogen. Now, this was an interesting design. So the nitrogen served as a kind of a, a meteorite detector, but not really. So what it was meant for was to see if a meteorite would strike the surface and would pierce it. And then if it did that, uh, the Sputnik would suddenly start losing nitrogen and it would start beeping faster. So it was kind of a detection system for basically a kind of a collision with meteorite or uh, a possible uh, decompression for some other reason. So basically, if something crashed into it, uh, the nitrogen would leak and inform, uh, inform the ground control by making a satellite beep faster. After the Second World War, the United States and the Soviet Union were in Cold War. And the launch of this satellite didn't really make things better. Uh, so yes, the Cold War escalated and the beginning of space race was essentially uh, glorified by this little sphere. But the thing is, at the same time, it kind of humbled the US because until that point, the United States were convinced that they had the uh, uh, technological superiority. They had all the technology and Soviet Union had nothing, but Soviets were able to launch this and this proved the US that not only were they behind the US, behind the Soviet Union in terms of uh, space race, but also it gave them um, a kind of a push to create all of these new organizations. So of course, NASA was born right after, a few months after the launch of Sputnik. So if it wasn't for Sputnik, we would never even have NASA. So this little sphere that contained nothing but a temperature and pressure gauge, it had a few batteries inside that lasted for 20 days, uh, 22 days, and the radio transmitter, all of this, and the beep, 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 beep sound, that was the reason why NASA was born, why space race has begun, and essentially this led to some of the greatest achievements that we have today, including being able to land on a comet or take awesome photographs of Pluto. All of this started on that day in October of 57. Now let's actually talk about the rocket itself as well. This design is based on the V2 rocket uh, that was used by the Nazi Germany in the Second World War to bombard uh, the United Kingdom. And uh, the rocket was this, uh, the V2 rocket was designed by Werner von Braun, who then, uh, under the Operation Paperclip, was invited to work for uh, for the Americans, and he then became part of NASA as well until I believe 1977. And so he was not only responsible for the V2 rocket, he was then also responsible for the Saturn rocket, which was the biggest rocket produced by the Americans. And so I guess the question is, how was the Soviet Union able to reconstruct this type of rocket knowing nothing about the V2? So what happened was uh, they did actually capture some scientists from Germany as well. But they had another brilliant mind, uh, Sergei Korolev. And this guy, he was a genius. His whole passion was not to create weapons, not to destroy the world, but to essentially explore. He actually got arrested earlier on in the Soviet Union for uh, stealing funds for building, literally building rockets. He was stealing money from his job um, and he wanted to explore, uh, you know, he wanted to explore the air, he wanted to explore the universe, he wanted to explore space, and he did that by constructing homemade rockets and launching them into the atmosphere and trying to see what happens. And so he was the mastermind behind this beauty called R7, including all other Rs. He was actually in, uh, in the spearhead of the Soviet rocketry program for a really long time until his death in... Uh, 
in the 60s. And he actually died because he essentially just overworked himself. He was so into rockets and he was so busy creating new rockets that he literally worked himself until his body couldn't take it anymore. And the thing is, because of the Soviet policy, nobody even knew who invented this thing until after his death because the Soviet Union was so scared that he's going to be assassinated by the American spies that they decided to keep his identity secret. So nobody knew that he was a hero and he's he never really did this for fame or anything else. Uh, he only did this because he was really into rockets. So let's just launch this one more time and see how it goes. Let's hope that it launches just as well as it did the first time. And uh, hopefully we'll get to see some other really interesting angles here. So this beautiful R7 uh, is essentially the future of space exploration, at least in Soviet Union and uh, in Russia. And so even the modern rockets have a very similar design, except that they're slightly larger, slightly longer. And even the capsules that contain people also have a very similar structure. So, and look at this beauty goal, so gorgeous. Uh, now, when the stage separates, uh, I'm gonna have explosions, but an actual rocket doesn't really do that. It just, I was too lazy to try to solve this problem, but uh, normally it separates quite nicely without destroying anything. And here comes the stage separation in three, two, one, nicely done. All right, so now all we have to do is wait for it to get into orbit again. And the awesomeness of KOS combined with the design of this rocket makes it absolutely brilliant. It will always assume a very similar orbit every time you launch it. And it's very, very similar to what actual Sputnik had as well. Now, before I finish this video, so I just finished talking about Kurilov and his brilliance. Now, one thing that most people don't know about him is that uh, unlike Von Braun, he actually had to compete with other Soviet scientists because a lot of people wanted to take his place and he always had to outsmart and outmaneuver them because that's, that was basically how Soviet Union worked. You couldn't really be the best until you outsmart everyone else. And one of his rivals was uh, Vladimir Chelomey, probably a name that you've never even heard of before. Uh, but yes, he had his own plans. Uh, he had his own plans for another rocket and he did actually uh, get to uh, design a rocket, but his rockets were not as successful, not as awesome as Korolev's rockets. And when Korolev died in 1966 and when his picture was actually uh, posted in the newspaper, uh, not, not just his picture, but his actual obituary was posted in 1966, uh, they actually uh, took his ashes and they buried him with honors uh, right by the Kremlin. So he's actually still uh, seen as a kind of a hero in the Soviet Union and in Russia as well. And despite being completely unknown until his death, uh, he now has all of these sculptures and all of these uh, memorials in, uh, in Kazakhstan and Russia. So he's quite a well-known scientist. But unfortunately, in the Soviet Union, he was not known for the rockets as much as the fact that he developed the first ICBM in the world. ICBM is the Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, which is meant to destroy people. So in the Soviet Union, he was actually, unfortunately, honored for that, more so than the rocket that took uh, Sputnik into orbit. And here's our final separation. We're going to open the top part of the rocket and here comes Sputnik, starts its beeping transmission, and this is the end of the mission. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. This is the first episode of the history of space flight using Kerbal Space Program and other space games that I'm going to be using to explain, explore, and inform you of the awesomeness of space exploration. Hopefully this video inspired you, hopefully you learned a little bit from it, and if you did, subscribe, like this video, share it with your friends, show it to your teachers, and tell me what you think about it in the comments below. And in the next video, we're obviously going to explore the next mission, and if you know what it is, then don't spoil it for anyone else, because it's coming up soon. Anyway, thank you guys for watching, this has been What The Math, and game you later.